Um, I'm Brian Hardiman, uh, president of Thunderhead Engineering. Uh, again, before I get started, I'd like to thank you all again for coming out um, here with us in southern Spain. It was a bit of a challenge for us uh, selecting a location outside of the United States. Uh, Brian proposed a few things, and we said, sure, let's try here. Um, so it's a little bit harder for us to coordinate, but I think it's come together well. I'm glad to see everybody here and that a lot, most of you stayed around for the last morning. I see a lot of bags in the back, so I, I think people are are getting ready to, to make some flights, so uh, hopefully I won't drag on too long with the final presentation here. But again, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I think we've had some great talks um, and some good discussions, and I think it's been very valuable. Um, certainly from our perspective, um, we, we put this on not, you know, some people ask me, is this a Pyrosim and Pathfinder users conference? It's like, well, no, we don't really want it to be that. Um, while, of course, we're a commercial entity, I mean, we were founded um, with the idea of trying to do something, develop some software that we also think means something. So we think that, you know, developing fire and evacuation software gives us a little bit more purpose, but we also want that software to be trusted. So we feel like we have to be transparent. We have to understand what everybody else is doing. I think it's great that we have presentations. I, I kind of cringe when somebody apologizes and says, oh, this is steps or this is exodus. I mean, we, we, have, we want that. We want to share because I think unless we share how we're doing things, particularly in this field, it's, it's not doing anybody in the public a service. So um, I was going to say some of that in my talk. I just got kind of ahead of myself. But um, again, I think that's great. And I think that's why we have tried to help continue the, the idea of this conference, because while we could show up at IFSS or SFPE conferences, I think it's great to have all the like-minded folks in one room um, and, and be able to share. So anyway, um, with that, I'm going to speak just a little bit. Um, I'm going to try to be a little bit like Charlie there. I think uh, it was appreciated that he had the uh, uh, composure and courage to handle Brian's new accelerated uh, uh, speaker encouragement there. <laughs> we actually don't know what was going on. I think there must be a sticky key on this uh, laptop. But um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to try to keep it fairly st straightforward as well, because I'm, um, I'm a mechanical engineer, software developer, um, although I wear a lot of hats at the business these days. You know, I would tend to get up here and want to talk to you about an algorithm of how we you know, traded a little time for efficiency. Um, but I know that's not everybody's expertise here, so I'm going to try to give a little bit of an overview of what we've done in our products for the last couple of years and uh, discuss some of the challenges we've had with some of the features we've implemented most recently, and then uh, finish off with uh, kind of where we're going and a few examples. So I've stuck to a lot of videos and not so much code or, uh, or uh, formulas. Um, just a quick overview of some of the things we've done recently in Pyrosim and Pathfinder. Uh, Pyrosim, you know, being linked with FDS is a lot more mature. Um, we don't think of, hey, there's a new fire we're going to add to Pyrosim or something. Um, so we, we limit ourselves a lot to usability type features. We've introduced a lot of things to try to help manage large spaces because that's what the commercial users are doing. So you can save views um, that help you navigate a large model and jump to different portions. Um, and we actually have done this in Pathfinder as well, like the model, we, the super tall building model where they were zooming in and out and trying to, I could tell he was using the scroll wheel on the mouse. If they'd use some of these view features, they could set up views on particular floors, floors and snap between. Um, along with that clipping and section boxes, those can be saved along with a camera view and you can quickly snap back and forth. Um, we've spent some time trying to improve uh, appearances, rendering and lighting. Um, this is sort of like, I think, why FDS gained prominence many years ago is because it had smoke view and some good colors, as everybody likes to say. Um, we hear from a lot of our clients. I mean, we even have some that are doing green screen presentations and putting together very elaborate um, videos with fire and evacuation. And so uh, the, the presentation aspect of it is very important for everybody. <laughs> Um, part of that, we've added some additional um, CAD support for some new file formats, and that's again kind of driven by the uh, appearance uh, issues again, because um, some of the formats that you get from Revit or AutoCAD, there's a lot of proprietary stuff in there, and you don't always get brick that looks like brick or that is sized properly. Um, but we've discovered using some of these other more open file formats like FBX or some OBJ uh, formats contain a little bit more information. We can display a little bit prettier output. Um, we've also added syntax highlighting in the last couple of versions um, for those of you that are still digging into the uh, input file from time to time. Um, so just a couple of examples of these features um, on the, uh, I'll try to use the mouse here. Um, on the left, you see a model that's embedded in a, in a city block model. And on the right is you know, a saved view that has clipped out all of that extra geometry and clipped off part of the building. Um, so you can save those kinds of section boxes. And we've, you know, it's 
kind of computer graphics, just drudge work, but you have to then fill in all of these cut surfaces to make them look solid so that it just doesn't look like a bunch of planes. Um, so our, our programmers have done a lot of good work on that. Uh, here's another example where on the left side is sort of the old way things used to look, and this is passing through an FBX file. You can tell, for instance, on the left, this file cabinet didn't get any texture because it wasn't readable from the AutoCAD file. But on the right, it picked up the texture because that was supported by the file format. And along with some of this work, we've done work to, um, we can recognize more readily now when, a, when an object is made up of multiple sub-triangles, which ones are flagged as the edge objects. And if you de decide to show edges in your view, they're now hidden if they're internal edges rather than external edges. Um, so this is just another example. This is actually a, a model of our home offices in Kansas. Um, that shows the kind of detail and realism you get going through uh, one, one of these FBX file formats. It's a little bit uh, annoying for a user because you have to export from Revit, then change it to FBX, and then pull it into um, Pyrosim. But the, there's some rewards in terms of visuals. Um, and again, this is just an example hiding those extra edges. It, it makes a difference, and we've improved some of the lighting models and added more local shading and uh, some different uh, ways to to shade surfaces. Um, part of that too is being able to read more information, like in the top here it's showing in the CAD file. Um, some of them don't have very much discretization for circular objects. I mean, in most of the CAD formats, they're actually defined as curves. So we've been able to uh, actually render them much more realistically in recent versions. Um, some of this we've also uh, migrated into smoke view even, because that was one of the things people tell us, oh, it looks great in Pyrosim, but once I get into smoke view, it's not so great. Um, some of that depends on whether you're, we're showing the, the block view um, or if you're trying to show your CAD geometry and smoke view through the GE1 file. Um, but what we did there was uh, one of the reasons it looked a little off in smoke view in the past is that any textured surfaces like this roof here um, were rendered uh, with basically lighting turned off or a very simple lighting model. And so we did some things to go into the smoke view source code and figure out which little places. It's not big things, it's just some little switches that needed to be flipped here and there. And we were able to get lighting to work along with texturing and some proper scaling of textures, which gets rid of, you can see a little bit of a sparkling effect in this grass that's gone, gone away and you now see the actual texture that was passed through. Um, so, and I believe we submitted that um, through the the GitHub system, I think these changes are in the, the current smoke view that's, that's bundled and available. Um, well, of course, to then see the GE1 file, you have to have a good way to write it. So I think that's where Pyrosim sometimes comes in. Um, and then here's an example of the syntax coloring, just showing you know, some keyword highlighting to help you easily glance through a file um, if you're trying to do some manual uh, valid verification of the, the input records that are being written. Um, for Pathfinder, similarly, we've been very busy. Um, I would say we probably spend a little bit more time and development effort on Pathfinder even because we're involved in the simulation and modeling side of that one as well. Um, and in the last couple of years, we've added uh, several new features. Um, we kind of started off with, um, we've had uh, requests for a very long time to be able to get the FDS data into the evacuation model. And the, the holy grail there is to even do the FDS evac style. You know, you really want to have this coupled uh, uh, behavior where you're you're having the evacuation agents reacting to and being controlled somewhat by the results of the fire sim simulation. Um, we've always kind of left that as a, a later priority because certainly you know our consultants with the A set R set hopefully you know never the two shall meet. But we know in in uh, real life there's often cases where you need to to look at overlap there. Um, so we started by implementing uh, reading of the FDS smoke view slice data and being able to display that into Pathfinder. Um, and that led us to other things like, well, how come we can't show, once we now can render contour, 2D contours in Pathfinder, we thought, well, we should be showing some of our own Pathfinder data. So we developed um, dynamic contours or animated contours to show our own data from Pathfinder, whether that be density, uh, uh, utilization, and those kinds of things. Um, then once we had that, we realized that, you know, we were still on an, uh, one of our original movement models where we had kind of a, uh, a desired separation distance between agents in our models. So early versions of Pathfinder tended toward a fairly uniform density, regardless of the, of the flow rates. Um, we, we usually had good uh, 
correlation with with uh, travel times and flow through doors, but the actual location of the occupants um, in very dense situations would be a little bit off because everybody was trying to be very polite and keep a distance from one another. And once we had these contours, it became very easy to, to check this and validate it. And that led us to uh, allowing the user to, to be more specific and, and input a basically a varying comfort distance with speed, which then lets you uh, recover fundamental diagram uh, type behavior. Um, along with that, um, we've done some movement on local uh, improvements to local movement methods, um, a lot of various performance things to try to um, just make sure everything uh, solves quickly. And we've started just a little bit of, uh, of work into trying to accumulate through the uh, FED options. You can select for individual occupants right now, not for everyone in the simulation, um, to track throughout the simulation to, based on the FDS slice data that you've output, you can accumulate um, exposure information. Um, but we still have a long way to go with that. So again, here's just some, some pictorial examples of what um, we've been doing in Pathfinder. So here, here's just some FDS slices, might be visibility or temperature superimposed with the agents. Um, this is an example of the uh, density contours uh, through a space. Um, and w w there are several things that you can dynamically render um, for the results of the Pathfinder simulation, uh, density, speed, level of service, uh, time to your, to your assigned exit. And the way we uh, implement a lot of that, I mean, you've probably seen some of these before, is we calculate a, a Voronoi tessellation of the space for every single time step as these people are going through so that we can assign how much space belongs to each occupant. And then you use that area to, you know, basically it's the inverse of that, gives you the density at that location. And then we map that back onto a triangular network to do the 2D um, um, colored contours. And uh, that's actually, I mean, we have one graphics and performance guru who's really our lead programmer on this kind of stuff. And uh, he takes great pride in that all of this stuff is very high performance and smooth. And uh, uh, so I think he's done a great job on some of that. Uh, here's just an example of the customizable uh, density relationships I was mentioning a moment ago. Um, you can input uh, a variety of speed density profiles. And you, these are actually broken up now. You can do them for level travel, for upstairs, downstairs, up and down ramps. Um, so it lets you um, put in as much or as little uh, of your own data into the model as you like. Um, I thought it was a good question when the, the previous presentations about validation. Um, it's always a problem. We'd always love to see more data. Um, one of our approaches has been to try to make our model not necessarily as tunable as possible, but to be open with how our movement method works and allow people to sort of experiment on their own. And what we've seen with Jensen Hughes specifically, I mean, I, I actually respect a lot of what they've done because they, they go out and do, they may not always share it because a lot of it's confidential, but they go out and do a lot of, of on-site research. And then their goal is to make sure that they're calibrating their own internal models to what they see. So they're doing a lot of their own internal validation of this stuff. And that's exactly why we've tried to to provide as much uh, input uh, flexibility as possible. And so what you see here on the bottom is just if we plug in a, an SFPE, uh, the, the equations in the handbook for uh, uh, speed and density, that then when we run our model, you see that you know th this is all the light gray circles or, or, or X's or, or the variation of all the occupants in the model. And the mean is basically right along uh, what you would expect to see um, for a, a uh, standard fundamental diagram type uh, presentation of it. Um, whoa, and there it's going to go on me. Might be an interesting rest of the presentation. Um, we also, as I said, improved a lot of things related to local movement. Um, there's actually a lot of small ones that I didn't all list out, but one, one very obvious one was cornering in older versions. Um, we have kind of a, a point to point routing uh, where we calculate the way out of a building. And often what will happen here is that all of these occupants are trying to reach this corner point. So you see these folks over here are facing the corner and that kind of created an artificial bottleneck going around this corner. And we added some more smarts into their local movement. They're all still seeking the same path, but now they're able to more easily form lanes and flow around the corner in a more natural way. Um, so onto some things that we're working on currently or that are being, uh, uh, should be released soon. Um, we want to go further than just FDS slice files and Pathfinder. So we've been looking into displaying all of the fire evacuation or fire results on top of the evacuation model. Um, so that began with the slice data, but 
uh, we'd like to import everything, the 3D smoke, the ISO surfaces, boundary files, vectors, uh, uh, pretty much anything that you can output from FDS. Um, the challenge with that for us is even though FDS and SmokeView is open source, um, it's not necessarily practical for us just go do that, tweak it, and throw it into our software because we use completely different systems. We have different code base. Um, so basically, we're writing all new code to do this, but we're um, leaning heavily on the FDS output file formats because we have to follow, uh, basically treat those as a standard. Um, at this point, we've been able to uh, uh, implement almost all of the file load uh, for all of the different FDS uh, data sets. Um, we've got a lot of the stuff rendering, but it's, this is all sort of currently under development. We haven't defined a user interface and how we're gonna plug this all together with Pathfinder. Um, but I'll show you some examples of what we've got so far. Um, there have been some challenges with this. You know, as you all know, from, for some models, the data sets can get quite large. And for some uh, output types, you can have an awful lot of data. And one of the things we notice with SmokeView is that sometimes it takes a long time to just load the data before you start to see your render. Um, so we've used some technology that we have experience with from our Pathfinder results itself, because there's a lot of data there with everybody's position throughout time through the whole model. Um, that we, we actually stream the file. We don't load the whole thing into memory. So we can, we can have a moving window that loads this file in the background as you're moving through. And it's, it's really quite impressive. And this has all gotten beyond from when I used to program at Thunderhead. Now I do very little programming. So it, it becomes much more magical to me than it used to be. Um, but you can skip around, and it's very quick uh, to get to um, these different parts um, of the file. Um, we've seen some other existing issues with uh, sometimes animations may not be as smooth as we would like. Um, so we've spent some time trying to figure out the, whether that, those are performance problems or, or just lack of data. And uh, one major one that you often see is that the, the time uh, resolution of your output data from FDS is not generally nearly as quick as your video card might be able to render it. Um, for example, you know, an average gaming type card could render anything, you know, from a movie frame rate of 25 frames a second um, up to, you know, 100 or more frames per second. But often the data out of smoke view is on a much lower or out of FDS, a much lower resolution. Um, so what we've done is, is developed ways to interpolate in the time domain. I mean, making up data, but in a reasonable way to interpolate through time to fill in the blanks and be able to achieve a smoother animation. Um, and likewise, we've done a lot to implement as much as we can on the graphics processing unit, so on the video card. And uh, there are a lot of new techniques with that from the gaming industry. And as graphics hardware gets more and more uh, sophisticated, that we can do a lot, leverage that a lot, and get, make things a lot faster and a lot prettier at the same time. And while at the same time using the, the main CPU and paralyzing it also, since we all have multi-core computers these days, and use both of those approaches to, to accelerate and improve the quality of rendering. So here's just a few examples. This is uh, sh showing kind of the, the influence of interpolation on your, uh, the amount of time resolution data you have. So this is a smoke view model that's showing some particles. And you can kind of see that they jump along here. And that's not because the computer is slow at rendering it. It's because those are the time steps available in the model. And then if we go on and see one of our prototypes here, this is with interpolation enabled. So now it's filling in at you know, 20 frames per second or more. Or actually, this one you probably can't see is rendering at about 200 frames per second. And it's a much smoother appearance of the behavior of the model. And same thing here, uh, being from Kansas, we might have an unhealthy uh, obsession with vortices and known as, especially the large ones known as tornadoes. Um, so somebody in the office, was this even Brian? I can't remember who made this one. Oh, okay, this came from somewhere else. But um, so here's with uh, smoke view, uh, and it doesn't look too bad here. There's a little bit more data resolution. And then here's with our uh, internal build. It's just got a little bit more smoothness to it and a little bit more impact. They're, they're subtle differences, but I think they add up in terms of visual quality over time. Um, and likewise, we've, we've spent quite a bit of time um, trying to optimize uh, smoke and fire display. I mean, I think actually over the years, uh, Glenn's done a very admirable job in smoke view of using some uh, modern volume rec rendering techniques. Um, he's given some talks before, but basically the, the technique in smoke view is to use rendering of orthogonal transparent planes that, that accumulate these transparency 
And it gives you a pretty realistic picture of things. Um, so here's a, a, like a jet fire in smoke view using its default, you know, this is what you get when you turn on your 3D fire in smoke. Um, but as you can see, it had a little bit still of that, uh, I don't know if I can play it again here. It's a little bit choppy, although it's harder to tell with this, the fire and smoke because again, the data resolution. Um, and some of it though is that while that's a good way to visually render 3D data, um, it's not always the most efficient. Um, so what we've done is essentially recreated that algorithm, but we've also leveraged modern hardware to essentially do the same thing on the graphics unit. Because what you can do is instead of individually rendering these planes, is you can load a texture, a three-dimensional texture. So in, think of it like a 3D bitmap or a 3D picture. You can load that data into the video card, and then it does the calculations of slicing and dicing that three-dimensional texture. Um, so you're saving memory on the, on the main computer and you're pushing all of this computation into the GPU. And it actually creates about a factor of 10 speed up in the frame rates that we're available to get from it. Um, so then this next image is using um, that 3D texture approach. It'd be a little easier to tell if I went back and forth, but it's a, it's, there's more data here because it's being interpolated in time and it's able to keep up with it now because we can render it at a, at a faster frame rate. Um, along with that, we've also tweaked some other things. And a lot of this is actually in smoke view as well. Um, but the, the default in smoke view is to show a sort of a two color representation with uh, one for the smoke and one for the fire. Um, but you can actually use black body equations in, in smoke view as well and use a, a more graded color map to represent the, the fire based on the local intensity. Um, so we've done some playing with that and some tuning. And so now, um, this is what it looks like when you use a black body approximation. I think it's quite strikingly different than the orange kind of blob of the default. And this renders very quickly. And we actually, even in, in addition to the 3D texture approach, we have another approach using what's called uh, pixel shaders, which is um, modern gaming video cards basically can compute, run equations for every single pixel in the output plane, which seems crazy that because we have 4K monitors, it's millions and millions of pixels. Um, but they can parallelize that and do it very, very quickly. So we also have a, another version of the fire rendering that in, happens entirely pixel by pixel and can give you even better color uh, approximation and it allows it to still, still stay that 10 times faster than before. Um, I think I have another picture here. Uh, Randy had shared with us a model, Randy McDermott from NIST, um, of a smoke view model that, of, a, of a beam uh, experiment that they were working on. Um, I don't know if this was his model or um, I should have asked before I came here. But <laughs> we don't, th and then this is just showing it with the, our realistic black body fire uh, algorithm. Um, I think I'll, did you load that other video on here, Brian? Oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Um, so with that, then, again, the end goal is to hopefully combine it all together uh, into Pathfinder. And so here's an example of a large uh, office building evacuation with a pretty dense population here. And then 3D smoke along with some particles um, floating up from the lower floor. So it's sort of a sneak peek of where we're headed. Um, we still have a lot of performance and quality things that we're working on internally and the user interface, um, but, but that's, that's where we're headed on integrating the results together. Um, here's just an, an, another angle of that same model. So anyway, hopefully this is what people have been after. That's our goal anyway. Um, I'm probably running long here. Or maybe you never started the timer. It's, oh, okay. It says 20. <laughs> so I assume I still have 20 minutes left. No. Um, in Pathfinder 2016, which, point two, which we actually had intended to release a couple of weeks ago, but still in some final, um, final changes, um, we have three or four main things we've been working on. We've added some occupant sources, which kind of goes to, I mean, we've had a lot of feedback from, from Jensen Hughes, who we've worked with closely in the last couple of years. Um, they've been doing a lot of ingress modeling, and uh, we hear it from other people as well, that they're trying to do things other than just evacuation. Um, that's not really a focus of our product yet, but we're sort of being pulled that way over time and trying to add, add features as we can. So we've added occupant sources, so you can generate agents inside a room or at a door. Um, we've been working a lot, again, we've heard a lot about assisted evacuation. Um, 
We needed to implement vehicles for that, so some way to represent the size and shape of a wheelchair or a bed um, or even a cart and have those people be assisted. Um, and we have the option in Pathfinder now um, that an occupant can require assistance, but maybe they don't always need assistance. Maybe they're in a wheelchair and they can move under their own power, but then they reach a stairway and then they change to needing assistance to go down the stairway. Um, and we've also added some other options because in early versions of Pathfinder, occupants weren't done until they reached an exit. And now we have ways to let them be considered as done when they've reached an assembly area that might be representing refuge or some sort of a muster area. Um, for the vehicle agents, um, this is actually some, some good work we had done by a PhD student last summer. He started it for us. Um, basically, what you can do is define a convex shape that then we have to figure out how to root out a building. You know, where will it fit? And I think we heard some of this in Aoife's talk as well. Um, our approaches are a little bit different, but uh, the end result is very similar. So what we have here are a variety of different shapes, and then you have to define the pivot points. You have to kind of tell it how do these things move. And the way we have it implemented right now, each shape has a single pivot point, so we don't really have a variable pivot point. But um, then we have to figure out, OK, it can only go through, say, this corridor when it's facing one way. So that feeds into all the local movement algorithms so that when a shape approaches a narrow way, it has to adjust itself so it can get through. Um, and that's a, a big challenge. And um, we heard a little bit how they were um, trying to, to incorporate that in building Exodus. We took a slightly different approach. I mean, it's the same problem. You have to figure out where it's going to fit and do all these intersections between both your geometry and the vehicle and between people and the vehicle. And what we've done here is use some clever, um, clever math and geometry um, known as Mins Minskowski sums or differences. So essentially, you can either take your geometry and build out the walls if you want to say people have a narrow, narrower way to move through, which is similar to what we, we saw in the earlier talk. Or you can, to, to generate a collision, for instance, between these two occupants to actually, or two shapes, if you had them moving toward each other, intersecting two polygons is a fairly computationally expensive thing to do. But if you convert these into this Minskowski sum shape, which is essentially tracing one with the profile of the other, you can almost think of it like a tool path of a CNC machine, then you can reduce the problem to line and point intersections with that combined shape. It's some really pretty clever geometry. But then we can use a lot of the intersection algorithms we already have uh, to figure out when things are going to collide and to plug into our existing avoidance uh, movement model. And there's a lot of other little things we have to deal with, like you know, our, our agents right now have a fairly simple way that they navigate around corners and obstacles. Uh, a vehicle may have to do a more complicated maneuver to get through tight spaces. Um, and right now, too, I was just asking Brian uh, what happened when we had two beds meet on a narrow corridor. I think right now, in, instead of just giving up, we've let them magically pass through if it waits too long. Um, but that's one of those areas of sort of investigation where you have to decide what are the best ways to deal with these. Do you want somebody to back up? Do you want it to lock up and let the user decide something? Or do you want to have some sort of override? Um, but we also have uh, different priority algorithms that try to make sure things don't get stuck. I think counterflow would be our biggest problem right now. Um, part of this too is you define for the, the vehicle that rep may represent your better your wheelchair, how assisters will attach. And this goes out to, is it a chair that needs two people? Is it a bed that needs four people? Um, you can define all of this in a little editor in Pathfinder. And then, uh, again, also then mark it as, as mobile or non-mobile. And the, it works a little bit interestingly in Pathfinder, a little differently than you might expect. But once an agent comes and attaches to the vehicle shape agent, it's actually the vehicle shape that then drives the movement on out, which sort of feels backwards because it's not the, the assister doing the work, but the, the knowledge of where it can fit is embedded in the vehicle agent. So that's how things move under the hood on the way out, and that's useful to know if you're trying to figure out why something is working the way it is. Um, so here's a couple of examples, and then we've um, the last step always is to then take some nice looking CAD avatars and plug them on top of these vehicle shapes. But here's a group with a couple of assistance teams divided up into, um, you can set teams of assistance and you can set groups of occupants or vehicles needing assistance and then mix and match and set uh, uh, behaviors based on that. So if I can get this one to play here, you'll see that they break up into three teams and they go to their assigned occupants. 
and move them out. I should have had this one run a little faster, I guess. But. And basically, they go to the nearest vehicle that, that is marked as needing assistance. And all of the, the way all of this works will be documented in our technical reference. Um, here's just another example showing the flexibility of the assistance team behaviors that you can develop. And in this one, there is a group of helpers here. Um, but they're only helping people who end up in this room. And then there's sort of a, so this is a sort of a staged uh, example. So the first group will take them in here, and then the next group will move them to another. And then what you'll see here, too, is that the group moving people here, once they're done with that phase of their job or their behavior, then they switch to a new behavior, and they're set to go ahead and take people on to assist with the next part of the journey. So it's just trying to show the different level of flexibility. And this goes, again, back to like whether it's the fundamental diagram. Um, we feel it's easiest to be as flexible as possible rather than saying, this is how people assist. Um, and in those behaviors, you can build up a lot of sub-steps. You can say, help this group of occupants. You can build in weights. Uh, you can even, I believe, then break up. You might be assisting, and then maybe you get to the bottom of the stairs and you decide you're tired. You could build in, now you're not assisting, you're going to wait for two minutes and then rejoin the assisting group. Um, so we hope that there's enough flexibility in there to represent all of the different phases of things. Now, we don't have an animation for like you're, you're getting the person ready and getting them on there. You would just have to build a wait in at that point of the, of the evacuation. Um, and this is just another uh, view of some of the same thing. I just threw this one in there because in a, a moment it'll pan around and you'll see an example of some of the occupant sources as well. So there's three portals at the end of this model allowing people in as well. And then also this one shows refuge where their end uh, goal is simply a room. Now, if you looked closely at the end of that last one, you didn't see they, they didn't fill that refuge room very well. Um, so that was actually one of the recent challenges we had once we implemented that feature, particularly with assisted vehicles. We found that you could kind of get jamming up if you didn't have a lot of smarts and people self-organizing once they get to the refuge room. So we had to, to spend more time than we expected um, on coming up with a new way uh, for people to look for free space when they get to a refuge area. Um, as opposed to just go to the back of the room. So this one kind of shows people filling a lot more tightly and uniformly. Um, and that's work that was actually just recently finished the week before we left, I believe, for the conference. So um, where are we going in the future with this? Um, we, uh, on the PyroSim side of things, we're, we obviously want to keep up with the FDS, FDS 7, uh, the immersed boundary uh, method uh, of geometry. Um, whenever that uh, managed to get ready for prime time, um, uh, we've been working internally on a prototype FDS simulation server, so it's a, a basically a client server system that you can install on workstations or servers in your own office uh, to queue up simulations or to, to uh, uh, farm them out to a, a simulation farm. Um, along with that, we're also talking with vendors, uh, such as the cloud vendors, um, to make it easier uh, for a non-IT person to set things up and run a model quickly on the cloud and just pay for the uh computation time. Um, again, the integrated fire and evacuation modeling, we're finally getting very close to that because we're reading in all the smoke view data. We've got it all there. Um, it wouldn't be simultaneous with an FDS run, but we'd be able to take the output of an FDS run and then use that to control behaviors inside the, the evacuation simulation. Uh, I have a feeling that it's still a lot of work, but we're at the point where we've got most of the prerequisites taken care of. Uh, grouping's another one that's been uh, on the wish list for a very long time. Um, and other advanced behaviors that would let you handle a lot of these more non-evacuation. Again, we'd probably try to do it in as general a way as possible, but in ways that allow people to perhaps even switch behaviors or profiles when they complete one phase of a goal. And we're already partway there with, say, the, the way the assistance behaviors work, but we'd like people to, for instance, go to a ticket counter, might be their behavior, and then once they've achieved that behavior, then they maybe have their go to the bathroom and find your seat behavior. Or, or for an evacuation, you might be um, going to, a, to an aid station and picking up 
a gas mask or a piece of equipment. And then when you go there, it actually not only changes your behavior, but your profile, because now maybe you're carrying a heavy, a heavy piece of equip equipment so that your, your movement speed may be slower or you've impaired your vision. So you, you may be navigating differently. Um, those are kind of our future goals. I mean, we have no timeline on that at this point, but um, I do have kind of a little teaser here. The model's not very interesting, but this is, uh, uh, what one of our guys was working on just the other day, prototyping some grouping behavior. And what you have here is what essentially he calls a, a tour guide. So they have a, a leader here and everybody's catching up to the leader. And then after they all catch up, the, the leader moves on. And so we're, we've been prototyping some of this grouping behavior. So that, that may be something that comes out sooner rather than later. Um, you can kind of see here, she'll break out of the crowd and everybody will move on to the next painting or statue or whatever they're looking at here. Um, that's about all I had for today. Um, again, I thank you all for coming and uh, welcome any questions you have. Now's your chance uh, to ask all the questions you've been dreaming about asking uh, to the president of the company. So any questions? Look at that. There's so many hands flying. I right. answered them all already. Yeah, that's right. It was such a good presentation. All right. Oh, that stuff looks awesome, to be honest. Um, the sort of integration between actually is having the smoke view, or the smoke movement around the uh, the Pathfinder models. How far off is that? Any idea? Um, days. Oh, that's soon. Yeah, we've actually in beta, and we've released uh, uh, test versions to our distributor network. Um, we just kind of got slowed up with a few last minute things, but yeah, the the display. Well, oh, sorry. I misspoke, not days. Our next release is days away. That contains the, the, uh, uh, the portals, the, the source, source generation of occupants, and the uh, vehicle movement and the assistance teams. Uh, the smoke display inside Pathfinder, I think our target is within the next 12 months on that. Um, but if somebody needs something for a presentation, they might be able to, if they're an existing customer, call us up and we can help them out somehow. But Because actually some of it's in there and there's some hidden console ways to activate some of it. Um, and that will go out with this release in a few days. It just won't be, there's no user interface for it and you won't be able to use it. But if you absolutely needed it, we could probably let you test it. So.